Our next presenter is Dr. Huey Lind. He's the director of our Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program, a program that is really growing very fast since he came and joined us. And we have also Dr. McGilvery here, who's, uh, who joined us from the Mass General for the surgical aspects of adult congenital heart disease. And Huey will give us the essentials of adult congenital heart disease within 15 minutes. Within 15 <laughs> minutes. It's going to be a race. So I like to tell people that um, this is uh, a lot like learning a foreign language. And in a lot of ways, it's actually learning how to speak pediatric. Because actually, in the congenital heart space, it's really only the pediatricians that have been dealing with this for the longest time. And so what we're going to do is see if we can go ahead and give you some basics of, um, of how to actually speak the congenital heart disease language. So um, here are my disclosures. But reality, probably the most important disclosure that you need is this is what my colleagues do every time they see one of my congenital heart patients. They scream and they run away. So hopefully in 15 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of a framework to try to understand this. And the reason why is the following. We think that the adult congenital heart disease population is going to be a tidal wave. And I'll show you some numbers in a second. But why is that the case? Well, it turns out in 1953, that was the very first time you could actually operate on a congenital heart patient because of the advent of cardiopulmonary bypass. So something that we've taken for granted forever and ever has actually only been around for about 60-something years. And with each innovation in the space of congenital heart disease, we've created a whole new population and added it to the population and complexity of adults with congenital heart disease, to the point now that it's a staggering number. So what you're looking at here is data looking at admissions to the hospital. In light gray, those are pediatric congenital heart patients. In dark gray, these are adults with congenital heart disease. And as you can see here, as we get to 2010, the adults with congenital heart disease are actually now catching up very quickly. In fact, we actually now know that there are more adults with congenital heart disease than there are actually pediatric patients with congenital heart disease. And in fact, it's about 1.4 million adults with congenital heart disease. And we actually think that by 2020, there will be 2.2 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States alone. And when you think about that, they are born with this, which means that they have a lifetime exposure of up to 70, maybe even 80 years. And that's a huge burden on our healthcare system. And when you extrapolate that number to Houston, that's at least 30,000, if not more. So it behooves all of us to actually understand some basics about congenital heart disease, just like it behooves all of us to understand some basics about echocardiography, atrial fibrillation, and the others. So the objectives today are for me to show you, and hopefully you will be able to explain the basic framework of congenital heart disease. We're going to talk about some important expected issues that arise in adult congenital heart disease, sort of the top um, issues. And then finally, the very easy one is the indications for referral, which is all of them. The ACC AHA guidelines now <laughs> recommend that every patient with congenital heart disease needs to be seen in an expert adult congenital heart facility at least once in their lifetime, for some of them um, at least once a year, if not multiple times a year. So here's the framework which we're going to work within. So we're going to talk about basic shunts. We're going to talk about right-sided obstructions. We're going to talk about left-sided obstructions. We're going to talk about atrioventricular and ventricular arterial discordance. And then we're going to talk about single ventricle physiology. Okay, don't worry, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. This is why we need to get them to expert centers. This is the beginning of what we're beginning to understand. So in the solid line, that's referral to a, uh, a congenital heart center, whereas in dotted line, that's non-referral to a congenital heart center. And there's at least a 5% difference in mortality. So if you get your patients to a adult congenital heart center, that means that they're probably going to do better. And that line will continue to separate as we have more and more expertise in this area. So basic shunts. So where you have your shunt actually um, changes how the patient actually uh, has pathophysiology. So for example, we break it down into pre-tricuspid and post-tricuspid shunts. So an atrial septal defect, which is known as a pre-tricuspid shunt, causes right-sided heart failure. They get lower extremity edema and abdominal swelling, et cetera, et cetera. The right atrium and right ventricle enlarge. In a post-tricuspid shunt, such as a VSD or a PDA, patent duct dysarteriosis or ventricle septal defect, these patients tend to get left-sided heart failure, at least as long as they have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. And that's usually the case in our children. And that's why a lot of babies will actually show up with heart failure when they initially present with a ventricle septal defect or patent duct dysarteriosis. By the way, I want to make a quick plug. If you are on Twitter, please go ahead and write down my, um, my handle, because I will send out a follow-up tweet in the next couple of days with a summary of all these slides to help to remind you of these basic frameworks. 
So let's get into the details of these. So there are a lot of different names for different types of atrial septal defects that are um, related to the embryological origin of these atrial septal defects. But what you need to know is that the most common atrial septal de defect is the secundum atrial septal defect. And that's good, because that's the kind that we can actually close with the transcatheter method in many situations. And so this is one of the different types of devices that we can implant, that we implant from the thermal venous access site. So that's the left atrial disc going in and the right atrial disc. And the indications for treatment are, as you would expect, evidence of right atrial or right ventricular enlargement, that right-sided heart failure that I'm concerned about, a shunt of at least 1.5 to 1, and a pulmonary vascular resistance that is less than two-thirds that of systemic vascular resistance. Because if they have irreversible pulmonary vascular disease, they may not be a good candidate for closing the atrial septal defect. So irrespective of whether or not the atrial septal defect is closed in a timely manner, you have to be aware of the fact that they may still develop atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension. They may even have residual shunts, especially if it was closed 40, 50 years ago, which may ultimately result in cryptogenic stroke. So those are things that continue requiring follow-up in these patients. Ventricular septal defects have many different names, and so I'm going to avoid talking about that because the typical presentation for you is going to be the following. For those who have large ventricular septal defects, they're going to typically present with Eisenmenger syndrome, which is a very, very complicated physiology and really should be managed in conjunction with your neighborhood adult congenital heart specialist. I won't get into too many more details other than to say they often have right to left shunting as well as, well as the possibility of developing abscesses and cryptogenic strokes from their right to left shunting. Um, they also often can develop endocarditis as a result of the ventricular septal defects. Um, finally, one of the things that is important is if you know that it's a restrictive um, ventricular septal defect, that usually means that it's not significant, with one minor exception, which is that those ventricular septal defects that are underneath the aortic valve can potentially cause aortic regurgitation and aortic valve prolapse. So that needs to be watched. And then finally, this is going to move us on to the next topic, which is that ventricular septal defects are often associated with right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And that needs to be looked at carefully. So that brings us to right ventricular alpha tract obstruction. So the right-sided obstructions, just like everything in congenital heart disease, can occur in combination lesions. So for example, you can have a tricuspid lesion. You can have a subvalvular pulmonic stenosis. You can have valvar pulmonic stenosis. You can have supervalvular pulmonic stenosis. You can even have pulmonary arterial stenosis. And unfortunately, a lot of times, they come together in groups. So if you find one, you need to look for the others at the same time. The typical patient that we're looking at is tetralogy of Fallot. So we're going to talk about that in specific, because that's the patient that's going to show up in your clinic. So tetralogy of Fallot, as you probably remember or may not remember, is right ventricular alpha tract obstruction due to muscle bundles underneath the pulmonic valve, as well as a ventricular septal defect. So the first thing that the surgeon has to do in childhood is to remove those muscle bundles and then slice across the pulmonic valve annulus and augment it by putting a patch, because the surgeon can't put in a prosthetic valve in that child because they will outgrow the valve. So what that means is now that pulmonic valve is now disrupted from the day that that surgeon uh, has done that surgery, which means that all these patients will eventually need a pulmonic valve replacement. What does that look like? So this is one of my favorite patients. He's 36 years old. He bench presses 600 pounds. And he's pretty much, quote unquote, asymptomatic, except for palpitations. What do those palpitations look like? This. So this is day two of monitoring on event monitor. Obviously, he's not asymptomatic. Why is he not asymptomatic? Well, this is his. MRI. So this is his right heart. This is his left heart. You can see how the right heart is taking up half his chest and squashing the left ventricle. Why? Because he's had 30-something years of wide open pulmonic insufficiency. So it's time to pay the piper. He gets a biprosthetic pulmonic valve replacement surgically. So that's his second surgery at age 36. And if he gets 15 years out of that bioprosthetic valve, he's going to need another surgery at age 50-something. Right? So what are we going to do with these patients? Well, it turns out that's where transcatheter valve technology has been extremely helpful for this population. So this is a bovine jugular venous valve that's sutured onto a stent that's crimped onto a balloon, just like um, Dr. Kleiman mentioned with the, uh, with the other systems. Um, however, in this particular situation, what we can do is we can introduce it from a femoral venous access site and take it up into the previously placed bioprosthetic valve. In this particular situation, it happens to be a homograph instead. And so just like with the other transcatheter valve solutions, it's fairly straightforward. You inflate the balloon. And as soon as the balloon is deflated, you have a fully functioning pulmonic valve. So we think that that's going to be huge for trying to reduce the number of surgeries that a lot of these patients are going to need. So let me just show you what that looks like. So this is one of my patients getting a, um, a transcatheter pulmonic valve. So things you need to be aware of. Beware of asymptomatic and the tetralogy fallow patient. Almost all of them are going to need a pulmonic valve replacement. A lot of them are going to be subject to arrhythmias and sudden death, just like my patient. 
Some of them will have aortic root aneurysms. Some of them may develop aortic regurgitation. And the key thing is they need continuous evaluation and need continuous evaluation for possible need for recurrent intervention down the line. So let's move on to left-sided obstructions. So left-sided obstructions, again, can occur in combination lesions. They can occur all the way through the left heart. So mitral stenosis, subvalvar aortic stenosis, valvar aortic stenosis, supervalvar aortic stenosis, coarctation of the aorta, which is a narrowing of the thoracic aorta, or even middle aortic syndrome, which is a narrowing of the abdominal aorta. And I'm going to show you one particular case, which has a couple of different problems. So this is aortic interruption. So um, in aortic interruption, you have a very extreme version of coarctation of the aorta. This patient had severe hypertension, which should always signal you in a young patient to think about coarctation. Um, the problem with coarctation is oftentimes, even if it's been repaired, you can have recurrence or even aneurysm formation. And in 10% of patients with coarctation, they can actually have cerebral aneurysms. And so you have to screen at least once in their lifetime for cerebral aneurysms. The other thing is also because they can develop aortic uh, aneurysms, you also have to screen them serially with CT or MRI imaging. And finally, many of these patients have bicuspid aortic valve and therefore bicuspid aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation. So let's talk about this particular patient, which you can see the CT here. There's the complete interruption of the aorta. Well, what does that look like? Well, this is what happened when we took him to the cath lab. Obviously, there's no flow whatsoever going through. So he'd already had a stroke because his blood pressure was 250 on medications. So what did we decide to do? So we took this, which is an RF perforation wire that we use from the congenital heart space, and then we created 3D reconstruction of his aorta on the table. And then we went ahead and used those 3D reconstructions to guide burning through using RF perforation wire across. Once we'd gotten through, it was pretty straightforward. We got the sheath across. We took this covered stent and implanted it using a balloon, just like this. And whoop. Uh, and I can't even blame their computer. It's mine. And OK. Well, anyway, so at the end of the day, beware of combination lesions. You can have aortic stenosis and coarctation, as well as mitral disease in the same patient. So if you see one, look for the other. Assess for thoracic aortic aneurysms in these types of patients. And now we're actually finding that some bicuspid aortic stenosis patients also have cerebral aneurysms as well. So moving quickly to the next topic. OK, discordance. So transposition of the great arteries, you may have heard when you were in school, doesn't survive childhood. Well, what does that look like? Well, the reason why they don't survive childhood is because the blue blood goes to the aorta, goes to the systemic circulation, returns back bluer right at birth. Same thing with LV gives rise to the pulmonary artery, goes back red to the lungs, and comes back redder. So the minute these babies are born, they are dying. So the first thing that you have to do is create a communication between the right and the left side, which is called the Rashkin septosomy, where we tear a hole in the septum to allow mixing. Now that gets them through the first several days and possibly even a few months, but you need to do something more definitive. So the first surgery that was initially invented was called the atrial switch, which allows you to bring the blue blood to the left side, which goes to the pulmonary artery, which is backwards obviously, it goes through the lungs, you get red blood, which gets baffled to the right side, and that's how you get actual red blood to the systemic circulation. But you can see where the problem is. The RV gives rise to the aorta, which means that you have a hypertensive right ventricle and that is set up to fail. What does that look like? Cardiac arrest. So this is one of my very first patients that I ever had. He's a 28-year-old man with atrial switch of transposition of the great arteries. He was running home from third base and collapsed suddenly, got CPR until EMS arrived, and was defibrillated from VF. He walked out of the hospital. Okay, so these patients are healthy, they can do really well, but they have major problems. So for transposition atrial switch, watch for heart failure, atrial arrhythmias, which can degenerate into sudden death. So you have to be very aware when they develop atrial fibrillation. The other side is that now we're actually doing something different called arterial switch, which is exactly what it sounds like. For transposition of the great arteries, you're going to switch the arteries. The problem with this is that you have to put the coronaries back into place. So the surgeon has to sew these neonatal coronary arteries back into place, which can give you coronary arterial kinking and lesions, which can give you an MI or cardiomyopathy in young patients. So when that teenager shows up in your emergency room with ST elevations, and it has a median sternotomy scar, take it seriously, because that may be it. They can also have pulmonary arterial stenoses. And these are coming because they're probably in their 20s at this point. So final thing is single ventricle palliation. And the only thing I want to leave you with on this is it's extremely complicated. Because basically what we end up doing is we take the whole ventricle out of the pulmonary circulation and create the fontan, which hooks up the in inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava directly to the pulmonary arteries. These patients get very sick over time and can have systemic issues, such as systolic heart failure, 
protein losing enteropathy, liver failure, cirrhosis, or even hepatocellular carcinoma, hemoptysis. So in summary, I have, I'm 30 seconds over. In summary, your shunts are mainly, uh, the, the pathophysiology that happens from your shunts is mainly where they're located. So ASTs cause right-sided heart failure, and you need to look for atrial fibrillation and pulmonary hypertension in your patients even after successful repair. Tetralogy fallot are subject to severe arrhythmias. Look for the need for pulmonic valve replacement. Coarctation is often associated with bicuspid aortic valve disease. Um, tri uh, transposition of the great arteries. These are the patients who are going to show up in your ER with ST elevations and cardiomyopathies. And finally, Fontan patients, irrespective of what their other diagnoses are, if they have Fontan, these are patients that you should refer, refer, refer. So be suspicious of asymptomatic. These patients have no idea what asymptomatic is and refer early and often. Thanks. Amazing. <laughs>